The big four native grasses of tall grass prairies are big and little blue stem, Indian grass, switchgrass, and prairie cordgrass. Big blue stem is the uncontested king. It rises several feet above a man's head, loves moisture and good soil, and is the preferred forage of livestock. The tall grass prairie is like a seasonal symphony. In spring, rain is its melody. The saturated earth brings worms to the surface. In one acre of native tall grass prairie, you might find 150 pounds of earthworms. Earthworms enrich the soil by consuming and recycling it. They aerate it as well. They are also a bountiful source of food for creatures such as this tiger salamander, who easily navigates through the upper layers of rooted soil to find a quick meal. April showers bring forth the low-growing, cool-season grasses and wildflowers that blanket the prairies. As summer approaches, the warm-season grasses that have adapted to drier conditions begin to rise with another set of flowers that are designed to grow tall to compete for sunlight. These grasses provide shelter and shade for those creatures who seek relief, such as this prairie vole. In autumn, when big blue stem and Indian grass go dormant, the cool season grasses emerge again in a green understory and the wetlands of the prairie become a rest stop for migrating mallards, teal, cranes, snow geese, and other birds, all travelers on the interstate flyways to points south. When the long prairie winter sets in, the grasses take a break from their growing cycle, conserving their energy under the snow, storing it up in anticipation of spring. A tall grass prairie is a living system, supporting a host of animal and plant life. All are intertwined, consumers of the abundance it offers. But the largest consumer of America's historic prairies was, of course, the bison. At the height of their dominance, 30 to 60 million bison roamed freely throughout the plains and the prairies. Grass was their meal ticket. 90% of a bison's diet is grass. Because of their bulk strength and swiftness, bison are well adapted to the grasslands environment. In prehistoric times, wolves culled the old, sick, and weak animals, keeping nomadic herds genetically vital and strong. And because a cow might live 20 years, giving birth every spring, bison populations grew to astronomical numbers.
Herds followed in fire's wake, grazing on the tender new shoots, then fertilizing the earth with their manure. Their hooves trampled seeds into the ground and their wallowing habits flattened vegetation, affecting the plant mosaic and fire patterns on the prairies. Bison were on the brink of extinction a hundred years ago, but they're making a comeback. Today, more than 150,000 of the great symbolic beasts graze peacefully on prairie grasses, and their numbers are growing. While bison range great distances, other grass eaters stick closer to home. Grasshoppers, for example, migrate into patches of grass, which they devour as efficiently as larger grazers. Grasshoppers possess a hard shell and mandibles that move from side to side rather than up and down. Some feed on leaves or seeds, while others are carnivores. Kansas alone has 108 species, which have adapted so precisely that each variety's camouflage is specific to the grass they prefer. No camouflage is sure protection in the hungry world of the tall grass. Here, an orb spider makes a fast meal by grabbing a grasshopper and wrapping it with his sticky legs. This spider is a tricky weaver, spinning a zigzag pattern of heavier silk near the center of its web so it can trap its victim, inject it with poison, and save it for hungrier moments. The spider is constantly at work, replacing one half of its website each day. Ladybugs and aphids have a similar relationship. Just like in your garden, aphids feed on perennial shrubs, flowers, and grasses. Ladybugs feed on aphids. The grass harbors an astounding assortment of insects. By late August, there may be 10 million of them in an acre of tall grass. A world of dragonflies, bees, ants, beetles, and scores of other creatures inhabit the tall grass. They are pollinators, honey producers, scavengers, soil recyclers, food for birds and small mammals. Each species has a job to do and is essential to the give and take of prairie ecology. Monarch butterflies are so profuse in late summer, they seem to speckle the prairie. Despite their visibility, they are shunned by birds, for these butterflies have a built-in repulsion system which develops during their elaborate metamorphosis. The monarchs mate in springtime. Shortly thereafter, the female, capable of producing up to 400 eggs, lays each one on the leaf of the milkweed plant which harbors a strong, milky toxin.
As the days pass, the caterpillar slowly emerges by eating its way out of its shell and into the world. As it grows and grows and grows, it changes color, munching on the milkweed leaves, absorbing some of the toxin into its body. In just two weeks, its weight multiplies more than 2,500 times. As its metamorphosis continues, the caterpillar hangs head down from a leaf, assuming a J shape, and prepares for the dramatic molting process. As the skin breaks, the chrysalis slowly emerges, and a new phase begins. The monarch butterfly develops within five to 15 days, depending upon temperature, and the chrysalis is transformed from a creature that walks on 16 legs and eats leaves to one that flies with four wings and sips nectar from flowers. Its body is covered with over one million protective scales, which contain remnants of the toxin, which birds and many predators find repulsive. The monarch is safe to pollinate the flowers all summer, to migrate to Mexico or California in brilliant clouds, safe to return next spring. The songs and wings of hundreds of birds rise and fall in prairie grasses. Prairie birds have adapted well to a grassland's environment. Their long-range vision is keen. They endure intense heat and scarce water, and they maneuver easily in the strong, constant winds. In a land with few trees, many birds are forced to nest on the ground. Although the nests are well camouflaged, they offer easy pickings for marauders such as this prairie kingsnake. Kingsnakes usually bite their prey and coil around them, suffocating them before swallowing them head first. Sometimes they swallow their victims whole. This dick sissel thought it was safe to leave her nest. Sensing an opportunity, the snake makes his move. There's nothing she can do as he helps himself to an egg or two. The distraught Dick Sissel may abandon her tainted nest. It's a smart move, for now that the snake knows where to find his next meal, he's likely to return. <laughs> <laughs> 